for the vote no group on what was called Proposition 1, named Roads and Transit by the Regional Transit Authority, known as Sound Transit in our Puget Sound area. Um, the three speakers, starting with Emery Bundy, will quickly recite the history first for you, uh, dating back to 1968, but it won't be the drag that you might imagine it fast forwards to 1995 and six and then right to the present. Um, Jim McIsaac deals with the financial aspects of the current ballot proposal that was up in front of the voters on November uh, 6. And then finally, um, Doug Simpson will talk to you about the political aspects of the campaign, the financing of the campaign, and different strategies that we use. You're going to hear some advertisements that were run on radio. Uh, and uh, I think you'll find this series of uh, speakers very informative with regard to a very contemporary light rail campaign in our Puget Sound area as far as in the rest of the country. And the magnitude of it, you'll find unbelievable. Uh, we did too, and that was part of the, had to be part of the strategy of how we presented it to the public. Um, once again, I guess I skipped my self-introduction briefly. I, I was in front of you yesterday, Bruce Nurse, Vice President of Kemper Development Company in Bellevue, Washington. And uh, I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. And we're a little bit late starting, so we'll move along. And I want to first call on Emery Bundy to uh, present the briefly the history of sound transit in the Puget Sound region. Thank you, Bruce. Um, he asked me to do a self-introduction, which quickly, lifelong Seattleite, uh, worked for King Broadcasting Company, a local locally owned um, company at that time, really good one, and uh, did a lot of productions in energy, transportation, land use, uh, environment, criminal justice. And then I was 19 years on the staff of the Bullock Foundation, a essentially an environmental Northwest funding organization, which is where I uh, got acquainted with Randall O'Toole, who did wonderful work with natural resources that we helped support. Um, very quickly, we had a, a uh, opportunity in 1968, 1970 for what was called forward thrust rail, a fairly elaborate rail system because we had um, the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, U.S., uh, as one of our senators. It was going to be overwhelmingly paid by the federal government, and the voters of Seattle did not see fit to uh, vote yes. And so the idea ever since has been that we could have solved our problems right then and we missed a great opportunity and it'll be more expensive from here on. And, uh, and there's this utopian idea and I've never been able to convince any of the people who report it this way, including in the media, to go and see what happened to Atlanta, who were the ones then who got our money. In every way, Seattle is better off than Atlanta is uh, in terms of transportation and in terms of transit market share uh, and the evolution of MARTA is, of course, something on the order of what we could have expected to have had uh, and avoided, fortunately, but there is this myth, and this is part of what we s deal with and suffer from in our region. In 1995, then, there came back uh, an idea, we were going to now have a 125-mile light rail network and, a computer and an 80-mile uh, commuter rail uh, in the Puget Sound area. Um, in 95, it came back. They decided that they might be able to get the funding to do half the commuter rail and half the light rail. There was a $6.7 billion, 16-year proposal, and it was well fought. Then it was defeated. Uh, polling was done, so then they came back. They ju jury-rigged the, um, the districts based on the voting the previous time. They said it was $3.9 billion. It was a starter rail. It added more buses, still had the commuter rail. And that won, and so then we got into the rail building business uh, called Sound, the Sound Move 10-Year Plan. The short of the Sound Move Plan 
uh, I will try to run through very quickly, and I don't mean to confuse anybody, but I want to tell you some of the elements. The commuter rail was supposed to be done in 2002 with 15 daily trains for a cost of $650 million. Uh, the current projected cost, capital cost, is double that. Uh, the current year of com projected year of completion is, is 2012. Uh, there are trains running for a good part of the route, but about half as many as were projected and with the equivalent ridership. Um, and uh, so we have some distance to go before that might be done. Uh, it, it works, but it, it in some ways it's sort of perverse given the whole idea of transferring development, et cetera, because the degree to which it works is that there are huge parking lots and parking structures at the stations, and so people can drive from across the countryside, and each daily commuter in operating costs is subsidized $9,000 a year. The capital cost is multiples of that. And so uh, at enormous subsidy, we facilitate people living long distances from commuting to work at public expense, about 98% public expense. The light rail is uh, another matter. This was to be a 21-mile central link, it was called. It was called a starter rail, just so Sound Transit could prove how well they could do the job, preparatory to them getting authority to continue with the 125-mile rail network. Um, we now are working on the initial segment of the starter rail, uh, which will cost more than the central link was to cost, have a projected one-third the ridership, start three years later. The entire package is now around roughly triple the cost and what we know today is that it will not be done in 26 it will not be done in 20 years uh, they're cutting stations out for financial reasons and for those of you who have other light rail projects you might envy us the cost the initial segment of the central link is 175 million dollars per mile and approximately 200 million dollars per stop the next segment that we'll recall tunneling under uh, a good part of Seattle to the university's Husky Stadium will cost $1.7 billion for two stops, $870 million per stop, uh, $540 million per mile. And then as we go out to the outlying areas, which is our current aspiration, it's kind of in between. It's an average of about $360 million uh, per mile uh, for that. So this is a fairly expensive thing. But we're still working on the initial segment of the starter rail. Uh, the Sound Transit um, will want to hurry to try another ballot issue, which is the one that you'll now be hearing about, because they don't have enough money to do the Sound Move 10-year plan in 20 years. And so they need a new level of taxing authority to continue on. I, wanted to, I want to show just a couple of graphics. So in short, the, the Sound Move plan has, has has proven how non-viable this is, and yet partly because of you know, a poor record of journalism in our region, and because Sound Transit spends more money in lobbying and self-promotion than their whole administrative costs were supposed to be. And consequently, there is um, an idea that's very widespread in our region that this is a good thing and it's really gonna do something for us, and Sound Transit is a good functioning agency and doing well, and this is a widely believed um, uh, political force within our region. Meanwhile, let me just show you two graphics and then turn it over to the next speaker. Yeah. Um, this, this chart goes from 1990 to 2030, which is roughly the, the era, era that I'm you know, currently talking about. From 1990, um, there was less than 30% of our total transportation money was being spent on transit. And 70%, and little over 70% were being spent on roads and, and highways. And this is of the central Puget Sound area, basically this, this, the area surrounding Seattle. And this is local and state and federal money entirely. At the present time, it's roughly 50-50. Transit has grown to about 50% or a little over, and uh, roads and highways are the other 50%. And the route that we're on now, by 2030, it'll be 65% uh, for transit 
and 35% for everything else. And one, and one of the things that I want to mention, like with 50-50 today, um, literally 99% of transit travels on the roads and highways because 1% is rail of transit. 1% is rail and 99% is, is buses. And of course, even the railroad, everybody drives to the station. But so this is the allocation, and here's, what we're, here's what's happening to us in terms of the performance of transit. The red line is where transit has gone from roughly 19, late 1960s, when we had the first rail proposal, to the present time. It's gone from 6% down to well, well, well under 3%, although the good news is it, it isn't continuing down at the moment. This is market share. And um, so as we've gone from 30% to 50% headed to 65% of all of our money being spent on transit, this is where the market share of transit is. And then the blue lines, which have something to do with um, our situation, this is our Metropolitan Planning Office, Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, when we were going to vote in 1995, they said vote for this small sound transit package or partial package and uh, we'll have 8.5% transit market share by 2020. And then each time a new projection has been made because time has passed and data has been collected, you can see what's happened to the projection of market share. And one of the things I, that I want to emphasize that the last one, uh, which has a little over 4% in 2040, this is assuming, whereas the first one was just based upon the small introductory sound transit package, this one assumes that the whole 125 mile light rail system is built out and, and the current, and I'm, I'm not going to get into price because I think it'll be, be touched on, but so in short, um, you can see what a disaster this is for us, that as the resources are absorbed into transit and uh, disproportionately in, in trying now to develop rail transit, um, what's happening to the transit market share, and meanwhile the relative resources available for other uh, uh, modes of transportation, federal, state, and local, are being progressively starved. And uh, that sets up the uh, Proposition 1. Good morning, I'm Jim McIsaac from the Seattle area. I'm a registered civil engineer by, uh, by training, but I've been from the time I got out of college till now involved in regional transportation planning in the Puget Sound region, including years with the predecessor agency, which uh, Emory referred to, the Puget Sound Regional Council. I am an analyst that loves to work with numbers. And probably, aside from the CEO of Sound Transit, I know more about their financial plan for the system they're building now and the ones they're proposing and have been proposing. Uh, I use public disclosure requests to get a hold of their Excel model. It's a workbook with some 56 worksheets all interlinked. They do a great job, I have to admit, in, in, in this financial planning, but uh, the problem is their board and most of their staff never see it and don't understand it at all. But I'm going to uh, tell you what the uh, roads and transit package is and talk about its cost and its performance before I pass it along to uh, our expert who ran the campaign that killed it. Originally, this was supposed to be an $18 billion 
program, road programs to do the mega projects that we have problems with. We have the sinking five corner bridge, the falling Alaskan viaduct, and a number of other multi billion dollar projects. But along came Sound Transit saying, hey, no, 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 we can't just do a road thing. We got to have a balanced roads and transit package. So uh, they, we cut the uh, roads package in half so that half of 18 billion could go to a phase two for sound transit. They started with a project list of some 80 transit projects that would have done a great job of expanding our nationally known express bus system that's eighth, fifth or eighth best in the, re in the country in care of work trips. Would have done great additions to that that kept their desire for rail. They pretty much threw out everything except the rail project and what emerged at double their, their share of cost was the 50 mile rail system. Uh, Emory mentioned what was originally promised, uh, a 21 mile system that, uh, that went from the airport, south of the airport actually, uh, to the university district and it was estimating at $2.3 billion and they said the estimate was so conservative that we should be able to ex extend the extra three miles to Northgate and we'll have it easily completed by 2006. By 2006, actually 2007, this is what we're getting. It, uh, the starter rail got shortened down to an initial segment from downtown Seattle to the airport that should open late 2009 or 2010, three to four years behind the date we were supposed to have completed the entire 20, 21 to 24 miles. Um, if they can come up with half of the $1.7 billion uh, just to get from downtown to nowhere, Husky Stadium, um, from the Fed, and the rest is going to be bonded, then hopefully by 2016, that dotted portion will be completed. And since they have so impressed us with how great they are in using our money and being timely with their delivery, they all, the, the board sat around singing to itself saying, ah, the public wants more rail. So this, this is the rail plan that uh, went on to the ballot with the red, being uh, what will be delivered by 2016, the blue being 50 miles of extensions that they, uh, they propose. And the capital cost uh, is 17 billion more added to the 4.2 billion that we've already spent. So we're looking at a $21 billion 70 mile rail system. And now roads and transit, you know, some people like roads, some people like transit, some people that like transit hate roads. And uh, we have that uh, road to versus transit <laughs> problem. The legislature and all its wisdom said, well, let's put them both together on a single ballot, all or nothing. And those people that like roads will vote for it. They'll just hold their nose and let the, uh, the rail system go along with it or vice versa. And uh, so that was it. We had a single, single ballot issue. Uh, the voters would be approving a 1% increase, a 1% sales tax increase. In our state, we're in our region of the state, we are an eight and a half percent sales tax now, or 8.6 percent. This would drive it up to 9.6 percent. Uh, in addition, 
will throw an eight tenths of a percent of car value, motor vehicle excise tax each year when you license your car. So if this had passed, 20% of all the sales tax, we, we don't have an income tax in Washington, just the sales tax to support the state while they get some property tax also. But 20% of the entire sales tax collection would be going to transit. Um, and then the question is, when does this tax end? With the road portion, once they finish building in 20 years, they would then pay off the bonds as rapidly as possible and, and sunset. They disappear. Operation and maintenance would just pass along to the state to use existing fuel tax revenues. But for sound transit, what they did with their phase one bonds so far is uh, they tied sales tax to the bond retirement. So they say, we can't reduce that tax until those bonds are paid off. They will be purchasing bonds out through 2027 and Anyway, since they'll be selling bonds out through 2027, 30 year bonds, 2057 would be um, the time the bonds would be paid off and they might be able to reduce the, uh, the level of tax. However, as you know, with transit, operation and maintenance goes on forever. So really it's a forever tax with some hope of maybe some reduction 50 years from now. So we focused uh, on the cost of the system and what it's really going to do. And the package cost was originally released to the public by Sound Transit. Sound Transit jumped in to both sides of the issue, the road package as well. And they decided let's only release capital cost and we'll put it backdated all to 2006 dollars. So this was the number they released, the combined total of the two programs uh, as 18 billion. We came along and said, hey, wait a minute. Everything else we do in this state, we always tell you what the cost is in actual dollars when it's completed. So we want year of expense dollars, YOE dollars. What's it actually gonna cost? So they released that set of numbers, 23 billion for uh, uh, their phase two rail, 14 and a half billion for the road package. And they have, the vote would also extend the existing phase one tax, I call SB1, uh, but they have totally ignored that. So anyway, now the public's seeing 18 billion gone to 38 billion, but we convinced the uh, Seattle PI to also ask them about how much more cost the bonds interest are going to be. So they tacked that on. It was now $47 billion. So we said, no, let's talk about how much the taxpayer ultimately is going to get hit for. And through that 20-year period out through 2027, uh, we found that uh, $35 billion in taxes would be collected. But by the time we extended out to 2057, the 50 year period, this whole package will have collected $157 billion from the taxpayers. And I had already mentioned why 2057, because it'll be 50 years out before the bonds are paid off and they can relax if possible the sales tax rate. A post-election piece that just came out in our Seattle Times um, last Sunday following the election says, for you people that are supporting tr transit, be careful, release one price tag and don't mention any other number ever. So many cost figures we discussed, the public was never certain which was correct and the mentality became 
if the experts don't know the true cost, how would we? Just uh, quickly, what its, what its performance is. Cost too much, does too little. In 2030, within the town transit tax area, there's going to be 13 million fish and chips per day uh, occurring in our region. Of those, 3.7% will be served by transit. If we invest in this additional 50 miles, the 3.7% on transit will go to 4.2%. But the important thing is how many new trips to transit? 74,000 out of 13 million. A half a percent change from doing nothing, doing nothing more than phase one. Uh, town transit, uh, like all the transit agencies, of course, like to release numbers in terms of transit boarding, but 74,000 trips uh, comes out to 157,000 more uh, new boardings. That means for every train, every ride on the rail system, there has to be at least one transfer. Uh, two boardings, that means a bus boarding and a rail boarding, or a bus, rail, bus sequence of boardings. But at any rate, only 74,000 or half a percent change in the future of traffic in our region for 141 billion. Um, what that means is uh, it, it's all focused on downtown Seattle. That's where all the transit is already all focused, so it's just an overlay. But only 10% of the jobs in the region are in downtown. I think as we saw yesterday, that's actually probably a higher percentage than most of our metro areas now. Uh, as far as what its effects on the rest of the region is, relatively minor. Uh, what this is showing is 5% of the uh, uh, total trips in the region are generated by downtown Seattle. Today, 27% of those trips are carried by transit. And we add the all of this more rail, that would go to 44%. But to the balance of Seattle, this uh, where 20% of the jobs are and declining, uh, they feel, Seattleites feel they're very transit oriented, but they're only at 4.5% transit use. They go to 6.5% with all this rail. But for the rest of the region, 75% of all trips in the region are growing. We go from half a percent transit mode share to 0.7%. So all of this uh, exercise really does nothing for the biggest part of the region, and I think that's probably typical of, of everywhere in this country. Anyway, I'll go from here to uh, Doug, who can now tell you what he did to help fill this hole. tell a little story here that might have already occurred to lots of you, but the elected officials in their wisdom when they called this roads and transit didn't realize they'd created the acronym RAT. <laughs> and uh, we, we really had fun with that in the campaign meetings, uh, but in the end, uh, we decided not to use it as a lead in the campaign so we could maintain a stronger position of credibility. <laughs> But we did have a person dressed up in a rat costume visiting shopping centers uh, on the weekends. 
Thanks, Ruth. Good morning, everybody. My name is Doug Simpson, and I'm uh, one of those political hacks that we uh, that we all like to hate. Uh, my background is I have a business called the Capital Project. Um, I've been in the campaign business for myself now for the last 16 years, and over the course of the past 30 years, I've had uh, the privilege of working for Kemper Freeman. Uh, that's uh, Bruce's boss, off and on, both as an employee and um, as a consultant over the years. And I first wor went to work for Kemper actually in the broadcast business, much like Emory. I operated his radio stations that he owned in Spokane. I started there and then moved over. So that's sort of my background. Um, over the course of the 16 years, I've done over 100 different campaigns, from candidates to causes such as this. And I have to tell you, I, it's, it's been something else uh, being involved in this whole sound transit thing, or what we like to affectionately call it unsound transit, uh, because uh, it is the biggest boondoggle that I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of them uh, lobbying in Olympia and our state capital and, and so forth. But uh, some of you, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Frederick Bossier, he was a uh, French statesman philosopher, 1848, he wrote a book called The Law, and he said this, he, and, I, and I, I love this, he said, the, st the state is that great fiction by which everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. And I think I, I've never seen it more plain than I, I did in this whole thing. A year ago, I met uh, with Kemper the first time for breakfast, and he asked me if I would come over here and, uh, or over to Seattle. Uh, at that time, we were, I, we have a little log cabin in Northeast Washington, and I like to stay there a lot. But he asked me if I'd come over and take this project on. And it gave me a very complicated um, marching order. He said, keep that SOB from coming across the bridge. And uh, so that was really simple. And I said, well, what, you know, how do you want me to do it? He said, I don't care. Just go figure out how we need to get rid of this thing and then get going. And I knew a little bit of the history because I had worked on this thing for about three years prior on the whole transportation issue with Bruce and Kemper and some of the folks that are here today. Um, I came back to Kemper two months later, and so that would be January, not quite a year ago, and I, I said this to him, and I, and I think this is probably the most important thing I really have to share with you today, because I really believe this. I came back to him with a two-part plan, and this is very important because um, if we keep you know, rising up and saying no to these boondoggles that come through and we don't educate the voters, we're gonna lose. And I can tell you that right now, um, I learned uh, in this, this past spring when we first did a survey on this thing, I learned um, just how ignorant the public really is on this. And I don't mean it in a derogatory sense, but they really do not understand transportation. They don't understand much of anything about government, but especially on this whole transportation thing. And uh, so we come along in the last six to eight, ten weeks of the campaign and try to change their mind after they've been getting fed BS for so long uh, that they think that what they're being told is the truth. And one of the most critical things that we found out of our survey was this. Um, we found that people want to believe the light rail will work. We found when we uh, did it in a, what we call an unaided research to find out what is the, what's on the voter's mind, two to one, traffic congestion was bigger than any other issue. I mean, more than the war, more than jobs or economy, more than anything, that is what's on their mind. And they want it resolved. The other thing that we found out when we did this survey was that um, if, we, if the election would have been held the day we did it, it would have passed 57-22. That would have been, uh, you know, the rest was undecided. And if, if all things being equal to that day, it would have broken out about the same. So we were gonna lose essentially by two to one on that day. So that was the first bit of good news that we got. Um, the other thing that we found out was because of people wanting so desperately to have uh, congestion relief, they didn't wanna believe whatever we had to tell them. Even on the phone when we were surveying, we'd start feeding them information and ah, they didn't care. And so we, we kept feeding them information, we kept bringing it down to a real personal level and finally we figured out what that was. And the message was simply this, and Jim actually already shared it with you, it was cost too much, does too little, and then there was one third thing that we 
so we used a little bit on here, and that was a natural distrust that voters have towards government. And this, um, and, and, and when we started telling them that they've been lied to, supposing you've been lied to, and you weren't told these certain facts, how would you feel? Well, then it went down uh, really by the biggest ratio. But by far, taxes were the number one thing. So after we finished this, I went back to Kemper and this group, and I basically mm -hmm. gave them a two-part plan. It went like this. One, the no campaign, which is what we're sharing here this morning. But the other one was we went and created an orga another organization. I'm not a bureaucrat. I don't like creating a lot of bureaucracies. But in this case, a very simple one for the sole purpose of educating voters from now until hell freezes over and ongoing. It, and so we started <coughs> with that. Actually, there's a group in on the east side of Lake Washington called the East Side Transportation Association that you've heard about. They started running some radio commercials in May. And then our new organization, which is the Washington Traffic Institute, came in and we started running some commercials starting in June. And uh, I always look at uh, political campaigns as very much like military campaigns, because that's really what they are. So I called that the zone prep. We were coming in with the artillery to start uh, getting the groundwork done so that when we got to the campaign time, which is right around Labor Day, we'd be ready to, to go. We'd have the ground more or less softened up. As with any campaign, we have all of the usual elements that you'll find in a campaign. Um, in this case, we created a website called truthabouttraffic.org. You can go there and take a look at it, which was to serve the Washington Traffic Institute and start putting up all this stuff. Now, websites are coming along, but they're still not what they will be in the future. And you can't win or lose a campaign on that. But people who do want to get informed the more independent voter <coughs> tend to use these things a little bit more uh, to try to get some information. Uh, second uh, on our list certainly was public relations. You all know what that is, and, uh, and I don't need to tell you that by and large the media is not friendly to what we want to do in here. They're friendly to uh, light rail and mass transit and socialistic type things. And it but, it, but I have to also tell you that through the course of the whole campaign, thanks really a lot to uh, Jim McIsaac and the very credible work he did on the finances on this thing, the media couldn't take it apart. And they started finally reporting the correct numbers or at least heading in that direction. I don't, they never did correct uh, get to 157 billion, although one TV station one night ran a story on that used that number that I saw, and they did some stories on that. Anyway, all of that, by the way, what he put up there once, you can build a case and say, well, you know, you just get one number and stick with it. But the truth is, once we started getting a lot of numbers that helped our cause because voters start questioning things, the credibility, the whole issue goes down, and so I was always smiling. Uh, finally, we did TV, we did radio, we did signing, we, uh, we, which is just a three-county area up in Seattle, uh, Kingsburg, Snohomish. We only did a thousand signs for each county. We've got that we have the Washington Taxpayer Alliance, who are no on every tax, no matter what it is, who came in and helped us place those signs. It turned out to be a great signing campaign. We developed, uh, my wife works with me, we developed a speakers bureau and got in front of every group that we could, uh, get in front of all of these elements you would have in any. And then finally in the end, uh, Sierra Club, and we did some on our own, but the Sierra Club, War does make strange bedfellows, doesn't it? <laughs> but, but they did some auto calls for us. There was a, some errors done in that, and I was a little concerned about it, but it turned out okay in the end. On fundraising, this was new to me because I'm used to, I figured when I came to town to Seattle to start in on this issue, I could just go to the big organizations like the Billing Industry Association of Washington and say, cut me a check for 150000 what I found out is probably what many of you found out or will find out when you do this, and that's that Sound Transit went back to 1995 and 96 and went and visited all the people who funded the No campaign before and compromised them, and cut deals and everything else. Bruce and I went to a meeting with one of the paving, the larger paving association in, in Issaquah. We sat down with this gentleman, and we're telling him a story, and he keeps interrupting. He's telling us how bad it is. And then we get all the way in, and this is what he says. He says, but I, he says, I can't help you. And I looked at him, and I said, why not? And he said, 
because in the last gas tax increase, I made a, quote, unholy alliance. And there was a lot of that. And I, I'll tell you, in all the time I've raised money for political campaigns, I've never had a harder time raising money than I have for this. It was just unbelievable. People didn't really believe we had a chance anyway. They did, absolutely didn't, so they didn't want to put pump bullets into a dead horse, and it was really just horrible. Um, the way the campaign turned out in the end, I think it was, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was the most expensive no or yes or no c campaign for anything uh, before, really at only $5.2 million, which uh, I, I believe doesn't count the money that Sound Transit spent out of the public coffers, because that would be okay of the legislature. They went out and direct mailed every registered voter in the whole Tri-County area. And, uh, but out of that 5.2 million, we only spent 794,000. And I can assure you our money was uh, spent much more effective than there was. As a matter of fact, what I did was I went out and bought all the media in advance so I'd get the lowest rate <coughs> way back in September. Uh, Sound Transit went out and bought weekly, and if you're familiar with the closer you get to Christmas, the more expensive the time gets. They were paying three and four times the spot cost we were. But I was getting myself strung out there because I didn't have the money. And uh, so you, you always play this game in, in, in campaigns and you don't know how it'll go out. Um, we had a couple of other obstacle, obstacles that I think were worth mentioning, and that is obviously an unfriendly government. The legislature wrote the ballot title in this case, and it was very favorable to them. And it said, in fact, it said in, in order to um, achieve traffic congestion relief. I believe that was in the second line. But all that, we knew that's what everybody wanted. Um, but nowhere in their advertising, you're gonna see a TV, one of their TV commercials, <coughs> nowhere, in, nowhere in their advertising did they ever say it was gonna bring you congestion relief. Because they knew better, they knew that was an out and out lie. They never would tell anybody, hey, you're gonna spend all this money, and guess what? Traffic congestion's gonna double. Because that was really the truth on the thing. So they didn't wanna say that. So whenever you did, I was in several debates, and a lot of these folks were, and whenever you would call them on that, if a guy would slip up and say it was gonna reduce congestion, you'd say, well, no, their, their own data shows it won't reduce congestion. Then they'll say, well, it will reduce it uh, below what would do, do if we don't do anything at all. Well, that's pretty lame. So the second problem we had was um, there were two Proposition 1s on the ballot in King County and I believe in Pierce County. And one of them was an EMT, a fire district thing, and then there was ours, and they took our Prop 1 and buried it into the title. It said roads and transit package. So we just had all kinds of things that really against us on this thing, so, some of which we could foresee, that was one of them. But yet in the end, I think uh, the overall numbers right now are at 57-43, that's what we beat them on. Now, there were some other ballot issues that were out there, and the first thing I noticed on election night when I started looking at the numbers is really what we saw a little of was a, a kind of an anti-tax move among the public. It'll always be that way to some degree anyway, and I, th I think you can always beat these things uh, on, on the whole tax message, no doubt. Uh, but we really saw that clear, I think, on election night. The other thing I noticed, we had a stronger turnout of probably independent voters than we did the real party faithful. And, uh, but you could just see this pattern. They were voting no on these measures and yes on measures that restricted taxation by government. So, and the numbers were almost equal. <coughs> we had a, a simple majority ballot title in Washington that would have allowed all of the school districts to go to a simple majority rather than a super majority vote, and they uh, they went down by the same, pretty much the same margin by which we won. Um, let me see if I can, I'm gonna try to play these TV commercials and hopefully they sound and everything will work on these. What I'm gonna play for you first is you're gonna see two TV commercials in one. You're gonna see theirs and then it just segues right into ours. So hopefully the sound will work on this. Oh really? <laughs> Once again, um, Sound Transit sold their whole campaign on innuendo and feel-good stuff. Thank you. Um, always implying that this was gonna do something about traffic congestion, but really never coming out and saying it at all. Uh, I don't know, maybe 
this won't work, hey? Let's try dragging it out here. Yeah. Well, I don't know what that, I don't know what that, maybe you don't get to see that. volume label is either too long or contains invalid characters. Well, it's just giving me a shut on all of them now. And now, episode one of John and Martha's Stuck in Traffic. We're going to hear us as our new liberated blood rail campaign is still on. Same to you, buddy. Don't do that, John. You should only use turn signals. Well, he deserves it. He's not getting so tired of these traffic jams. Day in, day out, signals are taking what do you mean it's not running yet? We voted for it 10 years ago and it pushed 21 miles, three and a half billion dollars. Yeah, well, it's just a short 10 years behind and almost three times over budget. Well, at least it's paid for then when it is paid. It'll never be paid for. What do you mean it'll never be paid for? I read it on truthabouttraffic.org. How sound transit went to court, forced taxpayers to keep paying phase one tax, basically, till they say stop. Besides, John, you'd be more frustrated if light rail was running. And why might that be? Because you'd have to drive to the park and ride to catch the bus to ride to the station to catch the light rail, then catch the bus to near your office, and still walk the last few blocks. Well, how long would that take, Martha? About an hour longer than being stuck in traffic right here. Get it. Truth about traffic. Let's see if we can get this one to go here. Ah, uh, come on, we gotta get this one to work. This is a good one. Hmm. Well, anyway. Uh, the other one was just, it really just banged on the whole $157 billion thing. And it just starts out that way, so strategic to make it. We just kept driving that home. And we knew we were finally making progress, I think, when um, we found uh, the sound transit was, uh, let me get that up now. Sorry about this. When we finally found out that uh, uh, Sound Transit started running an ad where they had a quote from our state treasurer, we called our stuff bogus. Now you never go on the attack unless you have to go on the attack. So we knew then I think that we were, we were on the right track. Uh, the polls were showing us dead even. Uh, that's always good. Um, and then you know we'd you get the rumor mill going. One of the things we heard was their consultants were running around doing surveys already looking into the future to figure out how they could revive this thing. And I st when I started getting phone calls like that, I knew we were on the right track. But you just really never know. We were outspent six to one. When I took this job on from Kemper, I told him, I said, he said, what are you going to need? And I said, well, you know, three to one, maybe four to one, we can win this thing. But if it gets beyond that, I doubt if we can. So I got to tell you, I'm a guy standing here who's very surprised that, that we won it as big as we did. I really figured it'd be a lot more of a squeaker. Where do we go from here? And I, I want to come back to this <coughs> WTI again uh, because I think it's so key. Um, we've got to educate the public. And the plan right now is to get the WTI, that's the Educational Organization for Transportation. We're not a think tank. All I'm going to do is take all the information from the ETAs and the, uh, the Reason Foundations and everybody else, and we're going to funnel that through and start educating the public. Now, we know they're coming back. So we're going to start educating them on things like light rail and just other things that they don't know about, uh, about transportation. And we're going to start that in January. So finally, let me just say this. It hasn't even been a week since the ballots were counted. In fact, the last of them are probably being counted today. We ended up 57-43. And there's already sort of this feeling going on. I'm hearing back that, well, we just we need to sit down and build consensus. And uh, you know, and I'm all for building consensus, but we've already done that. And you know, and, I, and I, I'm one of these attack, attack, attack guys. Uh, George Patton was my favorite general, and I really believe seriously right now that for our group, we need to stay on the offensive because we got them back on their heels. Their heads are still spinning. They don't know what what happened. They haven't even figured it all out yet. And we have a chance, I think, to take them out uh, on a permanent basis and start getting things turned around. But last but not least, let me just say this again. Uh, probably, and I told Kemper this early on, I said the WTI, the educational 
part of this, if we win this campaign, which we did, is almost more important than the mill campaign itself. If we don't educate the public at large about transportation, we're gonna lose this fight in the end because our troops get weary. I, if I would have lost this campaign, I couldn't have gone back to the few people who funded it and got them to come into the next campaign. Now the door's wide open. We can go back and get funding from those who were iffy. So thank you very much. We do have time for some questions. Um, I, just as a matter of review, we're talking about free market reforms. Uh, I think that presentation uh, heard a movement in the right direction, so it's not easy. Um, were, are there any questions of the three speakers that were here? Boys, look at the hands go up. What are we going to do all of this? I forgot. I didn't forget. But you didn't get to ask your question yesterday at the end, but you want to go ahead first today?
uh, so far up in the Puget Sound area, we one we heard Emory report four out of five elections since 1968. So that's our where we stand. They did get the one through. They did get a toehold. And now the question is if they'll be able to go any further. Uh, I have to take a few seconds to here to tell you the rest of the story because it relates to the American Dream Coalition. I've attended all five conferences that we've had uh, beginning back in Washington, D.C. And one of these earlier conferences, a gentleman from Austin, Texas, named Jim Skaggs, stood up in the middle of a discussion like this and he said, we just defeated a rail proposal with the bumper sticker that said, costs too much and does too little. And I never forgot it. And so when we convened our committee last January uh, with the people you heard this morning and several others, I put on the table, I think we need a tagline like cost too much, does too little, and we never let go of it since. So it wasn't my genius or, or ours collectively, it came from the American Dream Coalition and the value of coming to conferences like this and hearing things like what Tom Rubin just said. We did also bring Wendell Cox in in 1994 and he gave us the course, much as you've just heard and more about what to expect, where they would go, that they would not let go, they would come back and so on. So this is good information. Uh, time for one or two more questions before we go on. Yes?
Yeah. Okay. Um, the people will be available for questions later if you want to ask them directly of the speakers. And we're fortunate this morning to have with us uh, Randy Simmons, who serves as a mayor of Providence, Utah. And he is, has been a champion of local reform in his community. He's going to give that report to us now.
I think they're running that. Uh, so for example, the, the inflation of that electric, this, that, that little piece right there, that's about, that green piece is uh, about a 20 acre piece. All of the green are still zoned for agriculture. The yellow is zoned for single family traditional, which will allow lots as small as 12,000 square feet. This is the overlay zone for the old, old, old city. Commercial area down here, all that ag there will become commercial. And then some higher density over here. Lots there can go as small as 8,000 square feet. Now, yesterday there was some of those things, the big houses on the corner here next door, but lots and lots and lots and lots. Um, a lot more work to do. Um, the big argument they're having is about this piece right here and this piece, right, this white piece is a piece, uh, a county piece that you annex. Uh, this one has just been rezoned, and uh, that just got rezoned. And the four piece of against four here really kind of sucks by all of this. And so they turn to come up with uh, as a solution to the problems that were being created by people wanting to move downtown. Now they don't say it that way. They say it's caused by busy developers, and I always down what you're in here. You don't like the people who are moving to that city. Uh, who would you send away? Uh, that doesn't mean you didn't win the vote, actually. <laughs> this is the logo of Envision Utah, the organization created by former Governor Levitt to envision the state. I, 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 I actually quite do, it's quite disturbed as much, and uh, I do it his wife before he ever met her. And I helped in his father's campaign for governor in 1974. Uh, so I've known him for a long time, and I called him and I said, Mike, why do you want government officials to have visas? And he said, because it would be bad for the future. I said, but Utah is just like Al Gore. And he said, well, maybe Al Gore is trying to sound, sound like me. Uh, but so this is off of their, you know, this really nice stock picture from their, uh, web page, this is their logo, and folks in my city decided they were going to do smart growth through responsible stewardship. They called themselves People for Wet Water, which is something I will I'll get to very shortly. Uh, what they were interested in, if we go back to the zoning map, they're really interested in spatial segmentation, and that then means in income segmentation. These are the most expensive lands in the valley because the Cache Valley was part of the ancient Lake Bonneville, and when the lake was at different levels, stuff would wash down out of the mountains and establish different features. We now call them benches. So the va valley floors are 4,500 feet. The, the, the benches are go as high as 4,800. I live at 4,800 feet above sea level. And by the way, this is how I get this. This really is 17 feet below the unit. I hope it's a view. Um, but trying to keep down that direction, anything multifamily. Make sure that nothing happens here in the central city that would allow more people to live there. Uh, and I, sometimes I wish I had real new urbanists to argue with because what I find myself arguing is, look, let's just relax the zoning rules now so that people can do with their land what they want to do. And again, that's not something that sells really easily, so I have to find other ways to phrase what I'm doing. Uh, and then the idea that these green spaces here should be left open forever because um, we need more open space. Now remember that picture I showed you of all the mountains up here? I don't think there's more than a 30 minute walk from there even on the west side of town to where you can get to hundreds of thousands of acres of open space. But we were supposed to keep these these green ones you know, as uh, as open space, and in fact, Pershing lives right. Yeah. Was upset that the people immediately south of him wanted to subdivide their property, and I've known these people since I was twelve. When I was twelve, they weren't even hooked onto city water. The the people in the in the green, they had one house there. They weren't. They had a cistern that they where they ran irrigation water into, and then a pipe from there down to their house. Uh, I don't think they had indoor plumbing in 1962. And it's this family that Roy, who lives right there, wanted to 
stop from being able to sell that property and convert it to uh, to instead of alfalfa growing instead of growing alfalfa growing soy. And uh, I don't have much time for that anymore. <laughs> but we had a big fight over there with the people who wanted to be not smart grow a food farm for poor kids. What was their strategy? The first thing they wanted to do is they immediately challenge any rezone. The one piece I showed you, the little sort of triangle piece, they were this piece was rezoned, another piece next to Roy was rezoned. It's like a six twenty acre pieces. And they went around with petitions and got people's names on them to, to put up put on the ballot whether or not these these properties should be rezoned. And I explained to their attorney that under Utah law, a single property rezone is not subject to an amendment. And he said, well, then I may be wrong in your law. Uh, we went to court. We, were, we spent hours in depositions. And it actually took for two weeks when I got the charge. I was not in a good mood. It was a, a, an, an irritating day, I think, for everybody when I was deposed. Uh, the, on this property right here, what that was annexed, and an annexation under the Utah Constitution is uh, referable. So they went out and they got their, they got their signatures, and our attorney informed them that you know you have to have it in by December eighth, and they said, oh no, we don't because our forty five days start from when the mayor signs it, signs it instead of when it's w when it was actually passed by the city council because the state law says 45 days from passage. So then we had to go to court to argue about what passage means. Does the passage mean the two weeks that later when I signed it or the night that the city council passed it? And so we went to the Supreme Court just a few weeks before an election. Court said, the recorders that determined the petitioners failed to submit their petition within 45 days of the ordinance of passage as required by law. The district court agreed and granted summary judgment to Plaza City to be affirmed. Now, between this court, this case, and the uh, the cases on those other two properties, in the last 18 months, we've spent $74,000 in, uh, in legal fees. Put that in context. The city right next to us is about the same size. Their, their total legal fees for that time period was 10,000. Um, we have 1,800 homes. Our total property tax take is about $280,000. Our, our total sales tax take is uh, about 650,000. And from uh, this, the state road funds, from the, the, the state uh, gas tax, they get another $150,000. Taking that $74,000 out of that budget is a real big pile. Um, besides doing that, they were they tried to capture the planning commission by intimidating them. It was just killing us. Bringing their attorney to this planning commission and having him yell at the, the planning commission. And the planning commission chair is pretty weak and wasn't willing to uh, quiet things. They also decided that you know we are high desert. One of the big issues that, that we need to have is we have to have water. We have to have water in order to develop. Um, well, it turns out that in the Cache Valley, 88% of the water that has been developed, that is diverted from a stream or taken from a spring or a well, 88% of that is in agriculture. Only 12% in urban use and municipal purposes. So you can see it's relatively easy to, to trans, there's a lot of water to transfer from ag to municipal. Well, bring their, excuse me, another petition. I just love making these people feel like they're sharing me. Uh, but they ran a petition to stop the city from obtaining any water that had not been traditionally used in Providence. They called it their wet water initiative. Says we have to make sure that there's water in the cup before you can build a new home. And you can't transfer water right from somewhere else because that's just transferring the right. That's not providing new water. And when we drill that well, who knows what's going to happen. I mean, the aquifers are so full that we have uh, flowing wells not far from the city where the water will force it uh, to the surface. But that aside, that was one of their strategies. And they ran a slate of number of candidates for the three open council seats that uh, 
we don't do that until it's been last week. I talked to a friend of mine who has worked in lots of national campaigns who said they've made a fatal error. Their error is that they ran the initiative and the candidate. What you're able to do is demonize the initiative, and by demonizing the initiative, you can demonize the candidate. So the trick is this, and why do you admit it? Uh, that's what my daughter did. Uh, she's 33. She, she and her husband live in a little subdivision, uh, like one of those smaller lot subdivisions, and they have lots of 30-something-year-old friends, and they created a meatless organization, FathersMoms.org to battle against the people for wet water. And they went out and got donations, primarily from developers, but they raised $5,000 to run uh, direct mail uh, campaigns. They had free little postcards about this size that went to every, every home. And they were really simple. They looked like something that moms would do. Uh, simple line drawing. Um, they said, one of them was, who do you want to believe? The people for wet water or every water expert who has testified in Providence City? Um, and then they had one with a camel saying, don't turn Providence into a desert. Let's uh, don't take water from our children. And then the other one said that the people who wrote the, wet, the, the water ordinance are the same people who cost us $74,000 in lawsuits. Why would we want them to write our laws for us? wet water candidates were defeated. The initiative passed, or w was defeated by 63% uh, to 37%. Um, and right now, I was on, last night during the reception, I let my phone rang and I stepped out and I talked to my daughter for a few moments. She and the Providence Moms are now going to run a fundraising campaign to try and raise $74,000 to spend on visible things in the city. Uh, free uh, park structures, things of that sort. They got their first thousand dollar donation last night. And uh, an, a restaurant owner who was willing to, who was going to donate um, dinner for as many people as they could sell tickets to. Um, and tried doing these sort of, so thinking about, you know, you don't want the bastards to wear you down, so what do we, what do, we do to take the next step to keep them off balance and make them look like they are really selfish people when they have these moms who just love to swing in their children. Um, takes me to another topic but something useful. The state of Utah has a really cool institution called the Property Rights Ambassador. They resolve disputes, solve problems between property owners and Utah governmental entities. They're nonpartisan, they're a neutral state office, and it's so wonderful when I have a city council who wants to do something that might infringe on somebody's property, I say, let's call the property rights ombudsman. He'll come right up, we'll sit down with my council and say, you're violating state law. You can't do that. Uh, or there are ways to do it so that we protect the people's property rights. And if someone believes that their, their property is being infringed on by any <coughs> governmental entity, they call the property rights ombudsman, he can force uh, arbitration. They don't have to accept the arbitration, but if the governmental entity uh, insists on going to court, not accepting the arbitration offer, and loses, then the agency has to pay the, lo the legal fees of the, uh, of the property owner. It's a, I was mentioning to somebody that uh, the legislator who got, made this happen about three years later got all caught up in the open space preservation and became a non-property rights guy for his last couple of years in the legislature. So, uh, but there's now a real constituency for this office uh, because of the time. I mean, there's even a constituency for them at the Utah League of Cities and Towns because it just keeps you out of so many problems. And that's, that's what's a really useful thing is for us. Now, I'm, I don't know why I do these things, but I'm on the board of directors on their legislative policy committee. So during the legislative session, I go down every Monday and argue about positions that the league should take. Uh, and you know, there has never been a tax increase proposed 
And one of the legal theories in Town Street is that there was not a vast majority in support of it. In fact, I also may only vote against. But I did get myself elected to the board where I, I have more effect and then actually sent several emails to the chair uh, to relieve staff from guilting things and not doing enough uh, reviewing. And one of the things that we end up, I, I end up trying to deal with is this question of mayors and their vision. My planning commission came to me a month ago and said, would you come and talk to us and tell us your vision for the city? Well, so I said, what we want to do is protect property rights. We want to make sure, make the city relatively invisible. That is, when the Plymouth flushes, it goes away. If you turn on Eagle Pass, there's water there. The roads are smooth. The, the snow gets plowed. Uh, those are the kinds of things I talked about, and I was, they complained that I was just talking about housekeeping issues. I didn't have a grand vision for the city. Well, first of all, I really don't know what a city is. And secondly, if I don't know that, and it's, it's a, I don't view it as some organic entity, then why should I have a vision? But other mayors have visions. In the, in the most conservative city, in the most conservative county, in the most conservative state, that's Provo, Utah County, Utah. We have Mayor Billings, who has, I, Provo, the city of Provo, is running its own internet system. Um, they now owe more money than the assets are worth and they keep bailing it out with uh, sales tax funds. Um, in the city right next to me, the, the, uh, the mayor there is a, is a businessman. Uh, he's, he's all thrilled about doing the right thing about recycling, and so he's constantly leaving. Because of, he was able to talk the county council into forcing all of the county into doing forced recycling, uh, even though the numbers are just so bad for it, but it's the right thing to do. And in this sandy Utah, we have uh, Mayor Dolan, who is just a big player in the Republican Party, but he wanted a soccer stadium. And so we now have that Real Salt Lake plays in Sandy, and I think they have yet to win the league. I ask myself, why? Why did we get caught up in the division, as opposed to thinking more about what is the real role of government? And I, my conclusion was, I think that's what you're doing. It's so nice to be able to go tell your neighbors, you know what, it's not so bad. I'm gonna make sure you have the best internet uh, system in the world. And I, we all know that we, we all want each other. Let's, let's just leave that alone. It doesn't matter what it costs, it's the right thing to do. And it's much better to talk about one of these things than a city. And it's just, power is seductive. This is why we can go back to Barry Goldwater. This is from his acceptance speech in 1964. You can see why he lost. We see in private property and in an economy based upon and fostering private property the one way to make government a durable ally of the whole man rather than his determined enemy. We see in the sanctity of private property the only durable foundation for constitutional government in a free society. We do not seek to lead anyone's life for him. We seek only to secure his rights and to guarantee him opportunity to strive with government performing only those needed and constitutionally sanctioned tasks that cannot, which cannot otherwise be performed. Part of the job of any citizen who believes this is to try and remind his elected officials that, that limited government is an important idea. And for the very reasons that Barry Goldwater mentioned, um, I don't totally remember which member of the U.S. Senate I was talking to said, you don't need to elect Barry Goldwater. He only cared about two things, unleashing capitalism and, and, and kicking the commies. Uh, John McCain would be willing to take a knee to his own, but <laughs> that's all I have. Thank you. speaker, and I think pertinent to what you've heard so far uh, in this session, um, Arlene Diamond, Diamond Associates, she is going to talk to us about building 
uh, our coalition. I think you've just heard little pieces of that so far this morning. So Darlene, Arlene, excuse me, Arlene, pull it together. So if you can't give them the chicken in every pot, the next best thing is to intimidate them by stealing. And, and we just spent a couple of days hearing how well that worked. Thank you. So a little bit about me. I have a rather unusual and eclectic background. I'm one of those touchy-feely people you all hate. Um, I have an extensive background in business, in education, in psychology, and a smattering in law. And I combine all of those in a consulting practice. And I also have a huge background in association and community service. I've served on many boards and commissions, and I founded a couple of organizations. Um, so I, I come to you today with that background primarily. I've also written a couple of books that you might find useful, and naturally I brought them, and they're in the back of the room. One of them is called uh, Building Your Board of Directors, or Training Your Board of Directors, and there's a lot of information and exercises in it that will enable you to go forth and create your own organizations. And the other one is a fundraising book. So, so much for the you know, kind of commercial uh, piece of all of this. I've just spent the last few days with you listening to you talk in many ways about how you're trying to thwart the threat of constant government intervention. And as an old time objectivist and, and supporter of reason, among other things, and uh, Libertarian with a small L. I'm with you 100%. So I'm here to help you, hopefully, go to the next stage and to form organizations and to become active. Nathaniel Brandon defined uh, a value as something we act to gain and or keep. And a lot of us share the same values. And most of the people in this room, there's about 50 people that are here right now, uh, we pretty much agree with each other. And we come together, uh, and, and as other people have said, and you know, it's a cliche, but it's true, we are preaching to the choir. We are very busy helping each other gather even more ammunition so that we can take that ammunition and, and throw it out at people. Well, the problem with doing that is they don't want to listen to you. And as, as Randall will attest, um, and, and Lowell, many phone calls, many conversations with some of the civic leaders here in Silicon Valley have yielded a zero acceptance of, quote, the other side coming to be with us. So co consequently, you've got to think, are we really doing what we want to be doing? Are we as successful as we'd like to be in terms of drawing them in? So I want to say some harsh things to you. And, and among them I want to say, and this I guess comes back from the old objectivist days, that we're so quick to um, denounce and condemn anyone that doesn't agree with us. If, if you don't ha happen to hold my political views, um, then you're wrong, you're bad. And we treat people in that manner. And I'm here to tell you that you can't persuade anybody when your starting place is to, to demean them or denounce them. That if what you want to do is persuade somebody to your point of view, then the first thing you need to do is be respectful of their point of view. And so you have to start with a conversation. You have to start with a conversation that, uh, that leaves them thinking that you're giving them both courtesy and respect. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them. It doesn't mean you have to lie. It doesn't mean you have to be politically correct. It doesn't even mean you have to have a smarmy kind of smile on your face. But what it does mean is that you have to have the courtesy and respect. Thank you, Adrian <laughs> Cliff. You have to have the courtesy and respect to value that they might have something to offer you. And the truth of the matter is they very well might. They might be able to offer you information that will help you then move them from where they are to where you want them to go. And so what I'm talking about is, is psychology, it's touchy-feely, and it's an evolutionary approach to trying to persuade. 
we, we're very revolutionary and we're very reactive so that um, most of the speakers, most of the success stories that we've heard over the course of, of this weekend have been reactive success stories and, and very powerful and I don't mean to, uh, to diminish that in any way. I mean, we've heard some great success stories. But I think we need to reach out to all of those other people because if we just keep talking to ourselves, it's going to get awfully boring after a while. So if you want to persuade other people, then you need to find out where they're coming from and work from there step by step. That's how you teach children. That's how you teach those. Many of you are educators. That's how you teach when you're in a classroom. Um, I was a psychologist and therapist for a great many years. And if you're going to be effective, that's how you treat your patients. You come from where they are. So all the statistics and all of the information, we, we have a way of bombarding people with that in a way that makes them defensive and turn away from us. And I learned that lesson um, when I was married. Um, and that's why I'm divorced. I was, married, I was married to a very brilliant man who, among other things, was, was one of the starters of the Libertarian Party. He was very involved in the early days. And, and um, some of you may have known him. His name was Ray, it was Ray Diamond. His name still is Ray Diamond, I suppose. Um, and, and Ray could win any argument he was ever in. He had the most phenomenal memory, read constantly, and had facts at his fingertips that I couldn't remember if my life depended on it. But he never persuaded anyone. He never changed anyone's mind. What he would do was argue so effectively that he would, and he was also a big guy, Ray was kind of a football player looking kind of a guy. He'd back people into a corner. So they would they'd close <coughs> off. But they were defensive and that I'm Jewish, so I talk with my hands. They were defensive and they closed and they closed off all the time. So when you bombard people with facts and statistics, if they're on your side, that's very valuable. I think we everyone here today would attest to the fact that we've added ammunition to our, our supply of ammunition about the positions that we hold. But that's not the way to persuade other people. And if you listen to the successful campaigns, what was your slogan again? Say that again. Costs too much, does too little. Costs too much, does too little. Too little. Or the slogan that Lorraine uh, was telling us with the, the, the placards. Uh, those are the kinds of things that have immediate emotional appeal. And, and we're all emotional. Freud said, for example, that uh, all big decisions are made by emotion. So we have all the statistics and all of the arguments and all the rationality before us, but it isn't rationality that persuades. It's emotion that persuades. One of the things that I, I did for my doctoral dissertation, uh, which is on a subject completely unrelated to what we're talking about today, but I went and I read a year's worth of joint hearings in my field, in my topic, um, before the state. And what I discovered was that it was the radical, fanatic, emotional people that were the ones that showed up and the ones that spoke and the ones that won the vote, so to speak, because they were the only ones that showed up. And as you look around, people that are rational and reasonable are not out there picketing. We're not out there making fools of ourselves. And we tend, no, seriously, you know, and we lose because of it. We tend not to be doing this big emotional gyration kind of a thing, hoping that rationality and reason are going to be those elements that persuade. So I, I want you to think about reaching out to people that you would normally not reach out to. And instead of avoiding or ridiculing them, you know, or excommunicating them as happened in the old Ayn Rand days, um, you reach out to them and try to join forces with them. Now for some people that seems to be morally reprehensible, and it really is not. I mean, you know, I don't know how many in this room come from families where their parents were liberal Democrats, but I do. And I know Ari Fleischman does, because I heard him talk on this subject. 
You know, my, my parents were intelligent, they were moral, they were good people. They just disagree with my positions, or I disagree with their positions. And there are lots of people like that. Some of us in this room are Democrats, some of us in this room are Republicans, some of us in this room, you know, pray standing, and some of us in this room pray on our knees, and some of us don't pray at all. And yet, because the core of our beliefs is similar, we come here together. But there are certain kinds of things that we, we just write other people off about. And I think we need to join forces. And I, I just love that Lowell joined the Sierra Club to, to win, and you joined some of the, your group, one of somebody in your group joined the Sierra Club. Now, I would not join the Sierra Club in a million years, except if I heard myself talking today, and then you know my, I might bite the bullet and do something about it. So start to spend time with people who don't agree with you. Now that takes you out of your comfort zone and it makes you kind of squirm and say, ouch. But I think it's a very important thing to do if in fact what you want to do is persuade others and kind of grow the universe of people who believe the way that you believe into a much larger universe. Al Gore, whom I detest, is enormously successful at doing that and has ha almost you know, got himself the vote again this time. So think about how you persuade rather than how you argue. So we need to educate, we need to motivate, we need to persuade, and we need to affect change. And one of the ways that we can do that is by joining forces. One of the ways that we can do that is by being politically active, and you've heard that a lot over the last couple of days, uh, by joining existing organizations. There is, uh, on the free table, an article here called Gentle Engagement, and it's written by Barry Klein. And it has some of the most clever ex ex ideas in it of things that you can do to reach out to your communities. And I would really suggest everybody, if you haven't already picked it up, pick up this article. It's just fabulous. But I want to talk about how you can build coalitions and associations. And what I want to suggest to you is that you, sitting here in this room today, can form your own associations. You can form them as chapters of the American Dream Coalition. I checked this out with Randall. Or you can form them completely on your own. So I want to read you something. And I don't have a PowerPoint on purpose. These Americans are the most peculiar people in the world. You'll not believe it when I tell you how they behave. In a local community in their country, a citizen may conceive of some need which is not being met. What does he do? He goes across the street and discusses it with his neighbor. Then what happens? A committee comes into being. And then the committee begins to function on behalf of the need. You won't believe this, but it's true. All of this is done without reference to any bureaucrat. All of this is done by private citizens on their own initiative. Americans of all ages, conditions, and all dispositions consistently form associations to give entertainment, to found seminaries, to build inns, to construct churches, to diffuse books, to send out missionaries. The health of a democratic society may be measured by the quality of function performed by private citizens. Alex de Costa. Um, you know, that is America, and we're losing a lot of that. So I want to just kind of say to you, how can you reach out in this room? What are some of your ideas of how you can take the ox that's goring you as an idea? How do you take those elements of everything we've been talking about in the last three days and, and move forward with it? Has anybody got any ideas about that that they want to share? Yes, Doug. Good point. You start talking about things that you disagree on, you end up fighting with each other and you destroy your coalition. Thank you. That was great. Anybody else an idea? 
Yes, always. A little louder, please. I'm moving back to Manhattan and living in a high-rise apartment <laughs> building. And if I can get rich enough, I'm going to get a penthouse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a great uh, uh, idea, too. Uh, yes, I forgot your name. I apologize. Could you speak just a little more loudly? I would disagree with that statement, okay? I don't think any of us are how do I want to even phrase this? Ego less enough to not want to win an <laughs> argument. Um, and, I, and I, we have some of our libertarian friends in the back of the room. Let me let me kind of put them on the spot. Spot Adrian and, and Stan. What do you think about that? Do you want to win, or you just want to put it out there? Want to, do you want to persuade or just put your arguments out there, Stan? Uh, I want to give my book. Yeah, why, why write the book? Right. Very good point, thank you. So, so it, it, I'm looking at the clock here. Can I, let me, let me go on for a minute, no. okay? So it, we all have if you, an ulterior motive, as it were. I mean, we all want people to believe what we believe and to act in accordance with what we believe. And, and how we move them forward can be destructive, as my, my ex-husband style, or instructive and positive as the motivation uh, that Stanley just said about what Reason Foundation is doing. So it brings, me, it brings me to wrap this whole thing up. Many of you have joined forces with other organizations. I think you need to form your own associations 
I think that you need to have associations, you need to have committees, you need to create structure, you need to be able to put on a series of programs, you need to join forces with other organizations that are similar like to you, not necessarily the same, but similar in terms of the action items that you wish to accomplish. Uh, you need to raise funds, um, and you need to get advertising and public relations, you need a good story. And Lorraine, I think, gave us the perfect example of that. Uh, they created a good story. Uh, you notice there is no media here um, from the Mercury, for example, or Metro, or any of our local uh, Silicon Valley papers. Uh, we're too intellectual. We have nobody, somebody died in the middle of the room, you know? Um, when I was a kid, I got a camera from my parents as a gift, and, and it happened to be an automobile accident across the street. And so I ran out and, you know, did all the snapshots and tried to get it, uh, the Daily News at the time, the local newspaper. And when I called about it, the first thing they said was, anyone killed? And I said, no. And they said, well, we don't want your pictures. So you got to keep that in mind. You can't just do a press release that's full of facts and figures. It's got to have an emotional pull. And you've got to have advertising and public relations. And you've got to be able to bring in people that are of somewhat different views. Because if you have only, let, let's say you have a panel, and you have a panel of everybody that just believes the exact same thing you do. Well, then the only people that are going to show up to your event are the people who agree with whatever they've learned in advance about that panel, which is how I got to be here today, as a matter of fact. Lowell heard me say that uh, to a group, Fred, that, you know, how do we bring in other groups? So uh, the American Dream Coalition is prepared to have enormous help for you. Uh, Kathleen is available to you, Lowell, uh, uh, um, Randall told me that, Kathleen. <laughs> Kathleen is available to you. The American Dream Coalition is willing to help you with regional seminars, with technical assistance, with education, with a news service, with anything that you need to form your own association. So if you look around this room, you might very well be able to join forces with a couple of other people in this room. Because the steps that it takes are like this. You make your own commitment, and you make a commitment to action. You decide to dedicate time and energy to whatever it is you've made the commitment to do. You then find two or more people who agree with you. Your starting place is your core group. You put together a core group of people who agree with you and you get them to be your board. You and two or three other people form this association. You recruit them, you explain the goals, and you do do a vision. <laughs> and this is, guys, we all make visioning a dirty word. I make my living helping people do visioning. It's not a dirty word. Um, you, so you create your own vision and your own mission for your organization, and then, once having done that, and you create your boundaries and your, your basic parameters, you start to invite others in. And you invite others in through your social network. Because the people who are most likely to join you when you're an infant organization are the people who are your friends. They might be your neighbors, they might be your friends, they might be three other people that are you know here in this room. Because you want to start with a nucleus of people who are going to be supportive of each other and that's how you build your structure. Uh, once you've done that, you take this, this core of people that you've created, and you create with them what committees you might need. And every organization has some basic committees, but other committees. So it always has a membership committee. You might always have a fundraising committee. Uh, hopefully, it'll always have an advertising and PR committee. It might have a programs committee, and on and on and on. So there's you know, many different possible committees. And you then take your board members, your, your core group, whether you call them a board, an advisory board, a steering committee, whatever word you put to it. You take those people that are your core group and you have them be chair of the committees you've created. And then you create the parameters of those committees. 
It's not a free-for-all. And, and for those of you that are on the side of anarchy, I don't recommend it. It doesn't really work. <laughs> You've got to have some structure. Not tight structure, but some structure. Um, so you create some structure. And then what you start to do is bring in other people to serve on your committees. People are loath, except for your core group, people are going to be loath to make major commitments at first. But people are typically willing to make a, a minor commitment to a particular activity or program. So for example, um, if you have somebody that you, you want to bring into your program committee, you don't ask them for a 10-year commitment. You might ask them to help with the next program that you're planning. And over time, you kind of suck them in to bigger and bigger commitments. Um, so you're creating action plans. And you, what you do with the people that you bring in is you keep them actively involved by activities. Associations lose membership when all they are are dues, as, dues associations because people want to belong to something that they feel important in. So you've got to keep the social part going, you've got to keep their importance going, uh, and, and you've got to thank them and thank them and thank them. And that's particularly true in fundraising. And um, so I just went blank on his name. David, the, the, the president of Reason, when I was doing the fundraising book, I, David not. hey, I went blank. Uh, when I was doing my fundraising book, what I did is I interviewed a bunch of people, and David Knott was, was one of them. And the book got its title because of the conversation that I had with David. And the, the name of the book is a Please and Thank You of Fundraising. And you must always say please, and then you say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, a million times. And you make those thank yous meaningful, um, not token thank yous. And so you keep people actively involved in your organization by appreciating them and giving them important roles that, that are possibly very small, that might be all they can give you the time for, but they need to feel as though the roles are important. Then you, you collaborate with others. There are many people, I mean, look at all the, all the or organizations that have collaborated with this function. So if you want to put on a program and you want to reach out to the community, you collaborate with other organizations. And you, you can, as if you're the sponsoring or the primary organization, you have the control of the structure. But again, you can't be insulting. You know, you can't tell the person that uh, has a differing opinion, you only get 10 minutes, but we get six hours. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Um, but you do do collaboration. Uh, and one of the things, there's so many people in this organization that are incredibly powerful speakers, and you've seen a lot of them. You might want to create a speakers bureau, and you want to might want to bring that speakers bureau out to places like Kiwanis and Rotary and Toastmasters and all of the organizations, the, the kind of clubs in your communities, taking on specific topics where your starting point is what they're interested in and what they might be trying to fight. And then from that starting point, you wind up getting other people that are on your side. So think about what other organizations you belong to that you might be able to get recruits from and involve in your cause. Uh, think about what organizations you can personally form. Um, think about people in this room that you could join forces with and create something. And um, I volunteer, if you form new associations, I volunteer to help you create the structure for the fir first three people that approach me that want to, to create new associations. I will volunteer to help you with the structure. Um, but it's about putting your feet and your money and your time and your energy where your mouth is. And it's about stopping pontificating and learning how to persuade. Thank you. And my books are in the back. I can there you go. There you go. <laughs> Arlene, thank, thank you very much. That was very instructive. Uh, Kathleen, do we have instructions where to go for lunch? Is it right outside? Lunch is right outside the door. I think some people are still due to check out a few minutes. 
after 12 here, and then we'll gather for lunch and a presentation. Thank you very much. Surprised. I wonder if there's something in here too. Uh, I don't. I don't. Nope. Nope. Okay. I don't know that. What?